It was, it was actually a really sort of fun process to get ready for this because usually when you, when you have the Be Informed Partnership, which is, I thought was a large grant until I came to your office here, but when you have a large, one of these large grants, you end up being the cheerleader or just giving out information. And sort of this, this gave the opportunity to really sort of critically look at some of the things we're doing and things where we could do a little bit better or where we really need some help. And so I'll, I'll emphasize some of those points as I go through, hoping that maybe we can find some partnerships within this group. So basically, I just want to give you a really brief background about how I got to the point that we could develop this Be Informed project. The Be Informed project is the largest extension grant given out by NEFA so far at six million or just under six million for five years. And we're about a year and a half into it right now. By NIFA, the uh, Food and Agriculture. It used to be, it had another acronym. It's USDA funding, the, the, the arm of the USDA funding arm. And then throughout the talk, I really just want to highlight areas that we're struggling with. That we're, struggle might be a harsh word, but just areas that we're sort of, we don't know how to, we're looking for help to answer some of these questions. So I, I, um, I used to, well, after I did my master's in bees, I worked in the Caribbean for a while, and then I moved to Cornell, did their master beekeeping program for a couple of years, and then got a job as the state apiarist in Pennsylvania. But because I was Canadian, I couldn't work for the state government. I had to work through the Penn State University and, and run it as the acting state apiarist. And one of the things that really quickly excited me was I would come across these files of the history of inspection in Pennsylvania, which is the most complete bee inspection history in the country. And so this is a picture, it's, it's hand watercolored, it's the precursor to GIS, you know, graphing software. But really there was this great trove of disease history in Pennsylvania, and I got really excited about it. And um, I was encouraged to start my PhD part-time, which I did, and I thought it would be basically on looking at the epidemiology of disease in Pennsylvania. However, within six months of starting, this, this, uh, this guy, Dave Hackenberg, who's the largest beekeeper in Pennsylvania, called us to, to talk about his hives all dying down in Florida. And he, I remember very clearly that November, he had been bragging about how great his hives in Pennsylvania were. And as he does every year, he shipped those down to Pennsylvania, or into, to Florida for the winter. And he went back a month later and he found, he says he got on his hands and knees because he didn't see anything. There was nothing in these jars. It was like ghost town. It was a graveyard. And soon it became apparent that this was happening across the country in Florida and California. Later on, we coined the term colony collapse disorder to describe this very, very descriptive, rapid collapse of colonies. Now, the press have started using colony collapse disorder to refer to anything that's a dead bee or a dead bee colony, and that's certainly not the case. Colony collapse disorder refers to a very specific condition and specific symptoms that allow colonies to die. Um, and there's a lot more happening. We've been doing winter loss survey for six years now. We're losing most of our colonies. Very, we've been looking for CCD colonies for the last two years and we don't find any. So it sort of followed that classic um, emerging disease and petering off stage. Having said that, we're still seeing very high levels of loss across the country. And I'll come to that in a moment. So it was with this background of four years of realizing, okay, CCD, we've done a lot of, of different attempts to figure out what it was, and basically CCDBs were really sick versus those that weren't, but really most colonies weren't dying from CCD. They were dying from these other causes. And well, how do we go around classifying it, and how do we improve the system? Beekeepers losing 30% of their colonies or better every year is not sustainable, and we need these bees to move across the country and pollinate all these different crops. So half of the colonies in the country are moved from the east coast to the west coast, mostly into California for almonds. 80% of the world's almonds are produced in California. And it makes more money for the California economy than the grape and wine industry does combined. So they need as many bees as they can. And right now, they use every hive that can get on a truck goes to California almonds because beekeepers get a lot of money for it. They used to get 60, 10 years ago, they get 60 bucks a hive for a three-week pollination contract. Now it's $160 a hive. And so it's the biggest single input the almond producers are putting in their orchards is their pollination contracts because they need these bees. Well, you can imagine a lot of diseases can spread in this situation. If you have half the colonies in the country in a very concentrated area, if there's a disease anywhere, it's going to spread very quickly. 
And so we wanted to try to figure out sort of in a more holistic way of, well, how do we figure out what the diseases are? And more importantly, how do we get, get information about what the management practices are best to improve survivorship, especially of these pollinating units? And so we put a, a very comprehensive team together, um, a comprehensive team together, some, some notable bee people, of course, Jeff Pettis with the USDA ARS lab here in Beltsville, Maryland, Dave Tarpey in North Carolina, Marla Spivak in Minnesota. She's a recent Genius Award uh, awardee. And so we have some bee people, but we also wanted to diversify. We have economists from the University of Illinois. We have extension agents. Um, we have Wayne Esaias from NASA, who's been doing some, some mapping and graphing with hive scales. Um, we also have computer engineers from North Carolina um, and an epidemiologist at Hershey Medical School. So we have a, a, a diverse group sort of coming together. We also, of course, have the people who are doing the work in the field. Um, and we have, I think, last count, about 26 people working on this in various, in various components. I will say that as we were developing this, one of the things that the, the granting agency said really clearly was you have to make sure that you budget for a, a project manager. And, and that was Karen, Karen Rennick. And that has been an essential part. That was probably the best bit of advice we got during the, the granting thing. We've been busy trying to transfer this grant from Penn State to Maryland. We started that process in November, and it's still not done. And I would have quit if it wasn't for Karen. I, I can tell you that. So that, that, that whole leadership was needed. But we also originally, I think, were a little naive in how we wanted to structure these teams, in that let's have everyone equal and sort of interact. And that isn't working out. And so one of the things that we're really looking for is, is how do we do some leadership training for those people in the group that we recognize as being the leaders of these subgroups. And you'll understand these subgroups more in a minute. How do we get them the leadership training they need? And how do we do some of these team building experiences? What happens with these groups that are working and sampling is they have intense periods of times. For three or four weeks, they're working 80 hours, 90 hours a week, and then they go through dead periods. And so how do we figure out what's equitable there in compensation? How do we keep their morale up? And so these are some of the issues that are surprising me that we're having to deal with in developing this pro program. So let's go into the Be Informed project a little bit more precisely. And it was basically based on three points. And I'll go through these each individually in a moment. First, that the challenges facing the bee industry, what's causing mortality in the bee yard, were unprecedented complex and complex, and perhaps unsustainable. We also know that there, were, there are some of the answers out there, and we also realize that nobody listens to anybody. And that, I think, is the truth. No one is going to listen to someone coming down and saying, oh, this is how you fix your problem. People don't work that way. And so we wanted to, and beekeepers, I think, are particularly um, to that point. So let's, let's talk about each point individually. 30%. We've lost for the last six years that we've done winter loss survey, 30% of the colonies in the country every winter, barring this last winter where it was 22%. Now, if that was cows or if that was corn, the National Guard would be called in. There'd be, it'd be catastrophic. But because it's bees, this problem is masked. And the reason it's masked is if you're a beekeeper and you have a dead colony and a live colony, all you need to do is split that live colony in half, buy a queen from California or Florida or Hawaii, stick it in that colony, and you have two colonies again. So you can replace these losses very quickly. But of course, that costs a lot of money. You have to buy for the queen, you lose productivity, and all these other factors. And so what we find is that, in fact, even though we're losing 30% of our colonies every winter, the actual number of colonies we have in the middle of the summer has been going up a little bit. And that's because beekeepers now are managing more colonies so that if they take a 30% loss, they can still fulfill their February California contracts. And so there's a little bit of dynamics in this. We do know that some people have gone out of business because they can't keep losing 30%. So we worry that at the long term that this is the problem, that we're going to lose some of these large commercial beekeepers because that rate of loss is just not sustainable. I also want to say that in developing that number, you would think that's easy. How, do you, how many colonies were lost? 30%. That that's an easy number to calculate. I have been in, for total, five complete days dedicated at international meetings trying to figure out how you calculate losses. And that's because if you look at the honeybee colony, it's, it's actually a very tricky statistical problem. Because you have the individual bees, you then have the colony, you then have the apiary, 
then you have the operation, and then you have the whole local region. And so it actually ends up being a real problem on what your n value is. So what is your basic epidemiological unit? And so we're actually now looking for some advanced statistician who gets excited about this project to help us develop a new way of calculating standard errors and confidence intervals that takes into the fact that we have these different subpopulations that are related in various degrees. You know, the B is related to that colony. That colony is related to the apiary in which it's contained. And that apiary is part of an operation. And so these are all confounding and nesting things. And so it, it actually proves to be a very tricky statistical problem in how we treat this and how we, and how we develop the models needed to apply sort of basic human epidemiological methods. And so that's one of the things I think we're going to end up having to spend a lot of time is how do we do that. And that's certainly out of my realm of, of expertise. Now, if we look at the losses, this is a histogram. So this is the number of people who lost various percentages of colonies. And what you can see is that it's not even. Even though in, in this time, in 2009, 2010, you can see the mean and the median were 30%. Interestingly, 25% lost 14% of their colonies or lower. And so 14% is what beekeepers describe as a normal loss. We ask them, what would you consider an acceptable rate of loss? They say 14% on average. So 25% of our population is losing acceptable rates of loss, but another 25% is losing 53% or better from our loss. And so one of the basic ideas behind the Bee Informed Project or partnership is to figure out, well, what is this group doing that's different than this group? And so we want to attack that by doing various surveys, which I'll get to in a minute. But we also realize that we need to have a way of conveying this information. If, in fact, there are differences between these groups, we have to figure out how to identify them and then convince beekeepers to adopt them. And so our model for adopting, I use this, this allegory. So let's imagine we're all fishermen. And we have grown up fishing with worms all our lives. So we fish with worms. We're very happy with worms. And then along comes you know, a, a bee scientist with a grant. And he says, you should use frogs. You know, Use frogs. Frogs are a lot better. And you all, because you're polite, nod your head. But you go home, and you're going to use worms. Let's be honest. You're not going to listen to someone who comes until, of course, you see your neighbor who has decided to use a frog. And, and I think that this is the idea behind the, the Be Informed project, is what we want to do is, is, is engage stakeholder empowerment. We want to give information derived from beekeepers back to beekeepers in a very transparent way. So it's not someone telling them what to do, but rather showing this is what other people are doing, these are the outcomes, these are the results. You go home and you make your own decision about what you're going to do. Now, loosely, this was described in a paper about extension models, but th this isn't exactly what we're trying to do. And so one of the things that we're looking for is we're looking for help or identifying people who can help formally describe this as a model for extension. Let's describe it. Let's figure out what the impact is. And then ultimately, if I'm thinking 10 years down the road, if this model does work, I'd love to test this out with other agricultural systems. Um, and I think that that basic model works. And I'll give you an example of some of the things we're doing right now. So for instance, this is in input from one of our first surveys. So we do a winter loss survey, and then we do management surveys. And we just basically ask beekeepers various questions. Last year's survey had just over 2,500 respondents. And we asked them the question, did you treat for Varroa mite? Now, Varroa mite, we've always been saying for the last, since they were introduced in the 80s, Varroa mites are the number one killer of bees in this country. These are large parasitic mites. If we were a bee, it would be like a dinner plate feeding on us. They have very dirty mouth parts, which add viruses to the bees, and they make them sick. And so all, if you don't treat a colony, within three years, it's dead. And so a lot of mortality is caused by Varroa mites. So we've been advocating all the extension community has been advocating treating for mites, treating for mites, or doing something for mites. Amazingly, 61% of respondents did not treat for mites in the last year, which is sort of an interesting realization, like what's going on there? Some of it, I think, is actually driven out of an altruistic sense. Well, I don't want to have my bees dependent on chemicals. I'm going to breed a bee that's resistant, which is probably a little bit naive for how resistance breeding goes. But still, 61% not. But here are the results. And here we introduce the idea of confidence intervals. And so what we say is that if confidence intervals overlap, it's not significantly different. If they do overlap, no, sorry. If they don't overlap, they're statistically different. 
If they do, do overlap, they're not statistically different. So the idea is to make it very, very simple for anybody to understand. We also spend a lot of time in the blogs and the vlogs that we've produced for this explaining that this data is correlative, which does not mean it's causative. That there might be other factors involved in these differences. But still, this is quite an amazing difference. That's a 20% reduction in, in overwintering losses when you use a varroa mite, known varroa mite control treatment. And so it's presenting data in this very simple way in as many avenues as we can. We do vlogs. We have presentations at B meetings, um, and we just repeat it and repeat it. We're hoping that this will be taken in by our consumer group. Of course, we can also f break down the products that the different products that are varroa control products. And this is amazing because cumafos and fluvalinate are the only synthetic registered products out there. And what you can see is the people who use this product versus those who use another product who don't use anything at all. There's no difference. A real strong evidence that these two synthetic pesticides are no longer working, that there are resistant mite populations out there. The good news is that some of these more bio biologically based products, like Apigard, which is a thymol essential oil product, does seem to be working. But one sort of sticky wicket is that I call this product A, which is not a registered product. The United States is the only product country in the world that doesn't register this product. It works very well. And so one of the quandaries is, well, how do we report off-label product use that is essential? Or, or it seems to work. The reason this product isn't registered in the United States is it's incorporated into dog collars. Uh, it's Amitraz, which is a tick control. And so EPA, saying is, EPA is saying the risk exposure cup is full because people get exposed to this because it's in dog collars. And so in a way, dog collars are responsible for a lot of the mortality in this country. But one of, one, of the, one of the problems here is, so what, what, how, do we de how do we decide on sharing information that might be an illegal use? So that's, that's one of the questions that we're sort of struggling with. Another question which is also related is that there's a guy out in West Virginia who's been selling this mixture of essential oils for years. And I've always thought it was snake oil. Everyone who tests this product in the field says it's snake oil. And here you do this analysis. And you find, in fact, that there's a statistical difference between those who use and don't use. So what do you do about this? You have to be transparent and show this result. But at the same time, you don't, like maybe this is the one year that it worked and it won't work next year. Maybe it's totally related to something else. But if you are really aiming to give unbiased, honest representation of the data back to beekeepers, how do you handle questions like this when you think it's, it's a bunch of snake oil? And then the other one comes to, we can ask, did you use a protein feed? And you'll notice that there's this one protein feed that's just hit the market. Very few people use it, but it seems to have a very pronounced effect. And so do we, do we of course, we have to present that data, but what type of caveat? What is our, I guess the, the thing we're struggling with is, is what, what set of rules do we use to figure out what is ethically right to talk about and what is not? Because remember, if we're talking about some of these products, it's a, it's a backyard mom and pop operation producing, say, a special protein mix. And so if you say it works or you say it doesn't work, could mean the difference about whether that business stays in business or not. And so how do we, how do we incorporate some of these other broader concerns than just the straight facts, I guess, is one of the struggles that we're, we're working with. So I've talked a little bit about the surveys we do. These are our surveys. We, we send them out. We have about now between, we had 5,500 respondents last year to our survey. So our survey pool is growing and some really cool things going on. Another part of our project, though, is in-field monitoring. And this is basically concentrated in the queen producing regions in the country. And so if we look at California and Hawaii, which is not mapped here, each of these triangles is representative of a queen producer. And basically a queen producer, their job, their, their main source of income is not honey or pollination, it's to produce queens. Some of these operations produce 200,000 or better queens a year. And between the three operations in Hawaii and the 16 that we work in California, we estimate that they produce half to 60% of the queens produced in this country at all, all together. So you can imagine that if we can have some positive influence on how they're selecting colonies that maybe are better resistant to disease or anything, that could have a pronounced effect on the entire disease load in the country. 
we, we, do, we have expanded this now to the Midwest where we're working with migratory beekeepers who do a lot of their own queen breeding. And our plans are eventually to come down into the southeast and do the same project. So this idea of tech transfer teams working with queen producers to make more informed decisions about their breeding. And so we have this great tech transfer team that is in California. Um, and this was really, Marla Spivak started this, and we've sort of been able to tap onto it. And so I'll give you one example of the things we do. There's a test called hygienic behavior, and, and it's called the liquid nitrogen test, where you can get an area of brood. This is young bee, uh, this is cap brood. Um, you can see it's cap, so the pupil bees are under there. And you put this hole, and you put liquid nitrogen in, and you freeze those bees. And then you put that back into the colony, and all that larva is dead. And so what happens is you have bees that can smell they're dead. Some bees will smell they're dead and just walk away, and other bees go in and aggressively remove the dead larva. They are hygienic behavior. And it ends up being controlled by about three different genes that are, are um, sub, I want to say submissive, but that's not, that's not the word. Recessive, thanks. So it's submissive. <laughs> whip, whip. Yeah. Um, 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 so these re recessive, these recessive genes, and so it's easily bred out of the population. But the, we know that those bees that are hygienic, that remove the brood after 24 hours really aggressively, that they're much better at resisting all brood diseases, and they're much better at resisting varroa mite populations. And so it's a really good trait to have in your bees. And so we've been doing this, and now again, I want to emphasize, we're not telling the beekeepers what to do. We're just giving them the data and letting them decide which sounds like Fox News, I suppose. But, um, um, and what you, can, uh, what you can see here is that these are our 16 cooperators. You can see in the first year of our study, only two of those operations had a removal rate of above 30% or more within 24 hours. And then in year two, this is really hot off the press, you can see that already we've increased the number of their typical 100 colony breeding stock. We've increased the number. So we've had this dramatic impact on the number of bee breeders who are producing hygienic queens. And so this is exciting, and I think we're going to see this dramatically affect sort of the hygienic behavior sort of nationally of the bees, which is, which is sort of cool. Now one of the problems we have with these tech transfer teams, and one of the goals of the project, is to make these self-sustaining. And so we have an economist on board who's helping us develop a business model. We've already started asking these bee breeders to pay for some of the services. And bee breeders are like any other farmer. They don't want to do it, and they're fighting and screaming about it. But indeed, they're anteing up $50,000, so one-third of our labor force, um, to, to help get this done. And I think they're seeing the picture on the wall in four years from now and are really struggling with well, what do they need. And I think that that's another thing that we have to look at is not only the sustainability model, but also that we're not telling them what we want to test. A lot of them are saying, oh, we can do our own hygienic test. We, you need to be doing something else. And so how do we enter that conversation so that they have more control and are empowered as these sustainable models develop? Another thing they want to do is commercialize it or brand it. They want to say, this was a BIP, you know, you stamp each queen as a, as a bee-informed tested queen or, or some sort of branding. And that's not something we know about, but surely there has to be some quality control. It has to meet some standards. And so we're looking for help in terms of, well, what other models are out there for how that works? How do we protect integrity and, and authenticity and make sure we're maximizing that? So some marketing issues are emerging that, that, that I hadn't thought of earlier on. This is part of the project that I think is, is really exciting. Um, and the fact is, is that, that you know, Margaret's been kind enough to, to lend us her lab, and we've quickly sort of filled the lab, and we're now needing more space. And part of that process is because half that lab is processing samples. When they're out in the field, they're taking alcohol samples from these bees, and we're processing for different diseases that the bees have. Last year, we processed 5,000 samples. I imagine at the end of this year, it'll be 10 to 15,000. And during the peak at the end of this study, I think we'll be doing 30,000 samples a year. Now, we have no interest in becoming a lab just that's processing all of these different things. And so we're looking for different ideas on how to do that. We've actually linked up with, I'm really excited about this because I've been looking for this group for a while, and I just linked up with them three weeks ago. It's the Academy of Success that works in downtown or in western side of Baltimore. 
And they have this, this old derelict paint factory that they're restoring into a place for single mothers and for um, re rehabilitating drug users to come and learn trade. And so they're willing to set up a lab for us that we can then do this, this piecemeal. Like, OK, if you do a sample, this is the money that you, you, know, you get paid for it by, by, and what's the word I'm looking for? Yeah, there's a, well, anyway, we're looking to see if we can train unemployed mothers or people utilizing this facility to do some of the processing. Because once you have the scope and once you can enter stuff in an Excel sheet, this is pretty easy to do. We would, of course, at our lab, make sure that we're, we're doing quality assurance tests. We want to test this in principle. But one of the struggles we're having is, well, how do you train a group of people to do this? How do you make sure you're not taking advantage of them as you're training them? And then what's the equitable pay? And, and that gets complicated, because a lot of these people are in public assistance. And so at what level do they lose public assistance because they're getting paid with this program? And so there are all these, I think, nuanced parts of that that we have to think through, and we're looking for guidance in. I also think that there are a lot of ethical, and so, ethical concerns. I mean, I don't think I, as a white man, should be the, the face person for this interaction. And so how do you identify the appropriate people who, who they're going to trust that don't encourage sort of the negative stereotypes or positive stereotypes, but sort of really empower this group so that they feel ownership. And so that's sort of, I don't even know what the word is for the person we're looking for to help us with this, but we're looking for someone to make sure that we're doing it in a way that is, is most acknowledging sort of the, the historical disadvantages that this community case has faced, but also empowers them in as, in as, as powerful a way as possible. But I think that this would be a really great way of sort of helping bridge sort of urban and rural communities. And so here you have these two dichotomies and sort of meeting. I mean, I was there, I was talking to them, uh, the leader here who's a real dynamic, he says, wouldn't it be great if we could get them to come visit us here and we could go over there and visit them? And I can just imagine what an exciting exchange, exchange that would be. So how am I doing with time? Oh, I've, I have the time, yeah. Um, so one of the things that they do, our group does in, in, in California is they do colony evaluations. And so they measure all sorts of symptoms and diseases in the hive. I won't go into all of them. But I think what this does, and this is a project that Natalie will probably help it do, is, is help us understand some of these really interesting disease dynamics. And to do that, I want to talk about relative risks, just so because I think this is an important term. Relative risk of smoking is 230. And so what that means is, of course, you all know that if you smoke, you're not going to get lung cancer. And we all know that if you don't smoke, you're not necessarily going to get lung cancer. What 230 means is that for everyone who does not smoke and gets lung cancer, 230 people who do smoke get lung cancer. So that's what relative risk is. It's the, num the, the increased chance you're going to get diseased. And so we can apply this then to colonies. And so I did a longitudinal study where we were watching colonies over a long period of time. And one of the things that we found is that there's a real big problem with queens getting replaced in colonies. That suddenly the old queen dies, and they're replacing her with a new queen. And we're not really sure why this is happening, but it's happening at a very high rate. And so what we know is that for every colony that dies that did not have a queen replacement, two colonies died that did have a queen replacement. So there's an increased relative risk there. We also look for this parasitic mite or parasitic fungus, Nosema disease. This is what we're hoping that that Academy of Success lab will analyze. And so we can count that. Now, all colonies have some level of this. So we're looking at the threshold of a million spores per bee. And so for every colony that dies that doesn't meet that threshold, two and a half die that don't meet that threshold. So if you expect there to be no relationship between these two factors, you would expect that for every colony that neither has queens or nosema to die, if there was no relationship between the two, then you would expect that those colonies that had both, five colonies would die. That makes sense, right? Sort of. In fact, in the field, we find that the, 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 the actual measure is nine. And so obviously, there's an interaction that's going on here. And so one of the things we have is this huge data set that we're generating in the field. We have these data sets from other places where we want to sort of merge those data sets so that we can extract some of these relative risk factors and, and evaluate them. 
And that becomes a little bit tricky because everyone does things in a different way. And so we also have to sort of figure out ways of tagging that database. And this is, I think we touched on this just before we met, is one of the things we're working with an epidemiologist who says you need to meta tag it. And then I'm talking to the computer programmer and then they say, oh, you mean, what did he say? You need the archiving filter. And so you're talking to these different groups that have all these different languages and, and I'm in the middle and can speak neither. And it's sort of, it's sort of an interesting process on how, how do we come up with terms that we all understand and, and, and I'm not even sure I understand them when they think they're agreeing. So it's a, it's a, it's, I think this is an interesting struggle is how, the dictionary of terms and the dictionary of how we get all this to come together. Oh, <laughs> okay. Well, we'll put you on the conference call next time. Yeah. Um, some of the real cool things, though, I'm really excited about this, and this I sort of wasn't able to follow up on, but I hope is some of the things that we're doing is we do autopsies on the bees, just looking for stuff. So some of these things, these are the malpighian tubules of bees. This is their basically their kidneys, and you can see they're supposed to be white and they're stippled, and we find these nodules growing in them. And we have no idea what these are, but we know that they're predictive of mortality. Um, and so one of the questions is, well, we'd love to go and figure out what these different, these different things are. Um, these nodules are amazing. You never see them unless the bees are in alcohol for three days. And they look awful. You'd think these are terrible. But in fact, when you do the relative risk analysis, of three colonies that died that did not have nodules, only one died with nodules. And so it seems that they're, they're, they're a, predictor, a predictor of health. And so what are these nodules? Now this is really tricky because if you want to do, uh, your first guess is it's going to be RNA viruses or something. But RNA viruses you can't extract after it's been in, in alcohol. And so this produced, this is sort of a, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a difficult question to get at. And so this is one of the things that I think is, is really exciting. I'd love to have someone work on this because it's a little bit out of my field. But it's, it's sort of some really cool things are sort of coming out of this data. That, that there's, so there's no shortage of questions. So back to the, 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 original, the original BIP, core to it is this database. And we're really lucky that the recession happened because what happened was our database designer got, got fired and, and laid off two years ago. And he's been working with us since. And he's extraordinary. He's really a really good database designer. He's been doing some fantastic things. And so we're collecting all this data from desperate sources, from our surveys, but we also have surveys with different organizations um, and different tracking, putting it in the database to get some really clear outputs. And so one of the things we have is the National Honeybee Disease Survey, which we run through our lab and with ARS, where we go through and we sample randomly 25 colonies in each state and look at disease and pesticide levels. And so that's coming into our database. Um, we also have the Honeybee Net, which was a NASA project where you have all these hives across the country that are on scales and they get weighed every day and that data comes together and then we overlay that with flowering or greening of the environment. Um, and that really is our big next challenge um, is to figure out well what are all the publicly available data sets like the, the, the greening, like weather, like soil type because when I did this in Pennsylvania originally there was a clear correlation between soil type and some diseases which doesn't really make sense but it'd be nice to see this is on a broader scale. And so how do we integrate all these different pr publicly available data sets and layer them into our data set so that we can start looking across disciplines at some of these different projects? And I think that that's really one of the, the things we haven't figured out how we're going to do in sort of the next year or so. So I'm going to go back to, to, to this, this, this graph because I think another real cool project that's sort of designed for year three and four of this project is to start looking at historical data sets, not all of which is electronic. So for instance, if I look at the Pennsylvania data set that we, we, we got, there were, there's over 60,000 records in that data set that you can somehow incorporate into it. Um, and so looking at, uh, figuring out how do we go around looking for these historical data sets. How do we document them properly and how do we get them in an electronic form so that they're searchable and usable? Um, so that's, that's, that's one of the other sort of ambitions of the project. So I've gone through a lot and I'm hoping we have some time here for discussion and maybe in the subgroup afterwards. But just 
Um, a couple of other things that we're really working on is we want this to be an open access database. We want people to have access to it, to ask the questions. But we also have to be very concerned about sh uh, confidentiality. There are some beekeepers in this country. If you told me, oh, this is a beekeeper who had 60,000 colonies, I would know exactly who that beekeeper was because I know the industry well. And so we have to figure out, well, how do we share while at the same time we're ethical and protecting confidentiality, especially because they're reporting illegal use in some cases. So that's, that's one of the, the issues we have to do. Um, in database things, you know, there's always errors made. And when you find an error, how do you correct that error and how do you keep track of that error so if someone comes back and says, oh, I got a different result, they're aware of it. So these are new problems. And I'm sure other people have figured these problems out. And, and we're just at the stage of trying to figure out who has. Quality assurance and self-auditing. Ownership, who ends up owning this data? And, and is it the place who houses it? Is it the, the, is it the university that developed the software? So who owns the data? Um, we also really want to come up with a sort of quasi peer review system for our output. So we have an epidemiological output. We want to say something about the quality. Because we have blogs, which our people in our team are entering, but it's not necessarily data. But if you see this stamp, it means it's gone through some peer review process or so, some formal vetting process to make sure it meets certain standards. And so we're looking for examples of that and how to do that. Um, I've talked about the merging already. I think these sort of just sum up our needs that I identified for personnel, our leadership, some statistical tools, um, reporting ethics, sort of a standard for how we figure out what to report and how to report. And then towards sustainability, um, models for at-home diagnostic labs, that sort of, that, that lab we were talking about with the Academy of Success, um, documenting our extension model and stuff like that. So I think that ends my, my formal talk. So. Thanks. You guys have an exciting group here, so it would be great to get involved. <laughs>